Welcome to the Pat Mayo Experience, presented by DraftKings Byron Nelson, or AT&T Byron Nelson picks, bets preview one and done for the penultimate tournament in advance of the PGA Championship from Oak Hill. Let's fill up the Listener's League quickly this week. It's a limited field event for the Pat Mayo Experience Open because we want to direct everyone to the mega tournament we have on the go for next week. Once I get that link, it'll probably be by Wednesday show with Tambo. I'll throw that in. The Byron Nelson one is available right now. I think it's only 2,200 spots, 25, 2,000, something like that. Still, $15 to play, three max entry, no rake, and spots are at a premium this week, so get yourself in it right now. And and because major season is coming up, well, this is the second of the four majors. It's never a bad time to get it on FantasyNational.com if you haven't. The best way to do so, to dip your toe into the water, is wait until Wednesday, get the weekly, then you get the Byron Nelson and the PGA Championship for research, roster construction, lineup generators, ownership projections, and you can do that at FantasyNational.com slash Mayo. Highly recommend it. You can see the walkthrough that I did for the Byron Nelson on the research show, which is already out on the pod feeds and on Mayo Media Network. Sub to both of those right now. Jeff Feinberg, Wells Fargo Championship winner, Wyndham Clark. It finally happened for him. Saw a few people were on it, but uh, we did not get made whole for the years of betting Wyndham Clark, unfortunately. As someone who never chased it, I couldn't feel bad to have missed it. Uh, as our boy Kirshner touted, and I saw even everyone, Windy C, like that really caught on from our draft night uh, <laughs> back around Christmas time, Pat. So props to Windy C, like the performance of a weekend. Anytime we bet those guys, that's like you just wish they can get to that level of unconsciousness for the weekend. Um, and inc- like lights out, red hot, deserved it. I don't even want to say Xander was shit because I don't know that it would have mattered the way the way Wyndham turned it on um, near the end of the front nine yesterday. But he, he just like, I don't know, felt like he sort of shot himself for a four hole stretch. Uh, loves missing par putts inside 10 feet as someone that wasn't on him yesterday, but bets him a lot. I don't know. I feel like I've been, I, I was very familiar with what happened there, but credit, credit to Wendy, him and Kitty Am and now pull it off. I think people can make fun of me for saying, why the hell is Wyndham 60 and some other guys are a hundred. I didn't bet even the guys at a hundred, but I was wrong on all fronts. That is essentially why I think that was like verbatim what I said last week with Wyndham Clark. It's like, why is he 60 to one when Kitty Yama's 120 to one double as odds? He's already won one of these events. Whew, egg on my face. I guess people should just start betting the people that I think are ridiculous numbers uh, versus everyone else who's in the field because those guys end up winning. Speaking of winners, I did want to get a very special shout out. I saw you were tagged in it as well. Brandon Infinger, who's been a very long-time supporter of this show, and, and mo- basically almost everyone uh, in the PGA, DFS, and betting content streets for years and years and years. He won the 100 k and the $20, so congratulations, Thanks. Brandon. That is life-changing money. I mean, maybe it's not for Brandon. who I have no idea what his financial situation is, but I would say for the vast majority of people, winning 100 k in a DraftKings golf tournament – I mean, maybe it won't change your life a lot, but it should make your life a lot easier. So congratulations to him. Proof that if you watch this show, yes, it is still possible to win money. (laughs) Yeah, no, congrats to Brandon. He showed that ticket. I recognized him right away. The name, uh, you know, is someone, the handle that has been on our ride here with us for many, many, many years. So that one felt nice. I was genuinely happy to see that that one come home and uh, pardon my ignorance have they dropped the pga DraftKings prices yet like that could happen what tomorrow maybe it usually happens on the wednesday i believe that kenny and raza and myself are re- going to record on thursday evening it was going to be co- like i was going to record that then we were going to go live with the draft show with me you and cuss but it doesn't seem like the schedule is going to drop yeah, the schedule release show. Yeah, there's rumblings this morning that the league is already um, pulling back from their commitment of what appeared to be Thursday 
evening but um whatever i mean i'm excited to do that but you know it is is what it is i really prefer to not have to do a schedule show the week of a goddamn major i i was that right now i I was in the same boat because i was going to record that show on thursday night and then we're going to record the draft show and i'm trying to think of the pod feed and here's a little inside baseball when it comes to podcast analytics you drop two shows on the same day they're both going to suffer you might get overall better numbers like combined but if you just release them two separate days the the combination of those two download numbers and listen numbers would be much much higher so Anytime that you see that, go download both the shows, okay? I got Garion coming on tomorrow. Just me and Garion. Haven't done one of those in a while. And then Tambo on Wednesday, and then boom, full on PGA Championship mode. The first look, we got the research show, and then the full week of coverage with me and you, me, Rob, and Cam, Cust, Tambo. Everyone's going to be on the show next week for the PGA Championship. But I just want to go back to Wyndham Clark for a second because I think you hit on it. Is every time that we bet on one of these guys for a breakthrough or one of our favorites, uh, and I say that like Wyndham Clark's one of my favorites. You know, he's not Luke List, put it that way. That when I got hole on Luke List, it just felt so good. I, I'm not disappointed I missed on Wyndham Clark because I just don't think there was any way I was going to get to that number in this field based on the strategy that I came into the week with because I ended up betting on Woodland who obviously didn't win but he was 90 to 1 instead of Wyndham Clark's 60 to 1 and they essentially just came in with the same numbers except Gary couldn't putt and Wyndham Clark was putting a little bit more turns out that's a thing if you're putting a little bit better maybe that translates to a victory but to see him go unconscious on the weekend is just what you pray for when you bet on one of these guys and it just, it feels like it never happens. And it's funny that it happened to Wyndham Clark, a popular bet amongst everyone over the past five years. And the week that he does is the week. No one's on him. Yeah. Credit to there. You kind of said it. I don't really have anything to add. I was for, you know, not hitting a bet. I didn't think I was going to hit a bet coming into Sunday morning. I was happy to see him. I was happy to see him win. It's almost. Yeah. Yeah, he I don't even know if like because people can make fun of Xander, which I think can be a little unfair, despite me saying I, you know, he sort of like lost himself in the middle of that round right when he was in the heat of it. Or as soon as he started leading, he lost himself. But uh, I don't think Xander gets caught. I mean, Wyndham gets beat if it's an even stronger field, maybe like a different presence in that final group intimidates him or having played with Xander on Saturday created just a dynamic that made it cooler, calmer for Wyndham. But whatever got him in that zone, what, around like the seventh hole or eighth hole? And he didn't relent. And it was lovely to watch. Should have seen some of this coming because he was such a popular selection in Mexico the week before. I think that Tambo and I used him as our one and done. And he got off to like 18, 20 to one. He got off to a horrific start. In Mexico, and it, I just I saw my like entire timeline on Twitter. Oh my God, Wyndham Clark is blowing it. I think he was four over after nine holes or something like that. But he rallied, made the cut on the number, and ended up finishing inside the top twenty-five. Like if you throw out those nine holes, he actually probably would have been in the mix with Rom and all those guys. Maybe not quite up that high, but it probably would have been a top ten finish for him. That he kept that going, and he was the type of player that we identified that should do well at Quail Hollow. He hits it a mile, he puts well, and the irons have been. Really Really good so far this year, well above the rate that he's been having for the rest of his career. Like, I'm just looking on Fantasy National right now. Over his past 20 tournaments, he's averaging 1.6 strokes gained on approach. Over his past five, four strokes gained. Over his past 10, three and a half. Like, he's just been trending upwards. It does remind me a lot of the list win at Torrey Pines, but this was more dominant. Yeah, and I guess like list, like all along, we were just waiting for those other those other metrics to pop for him because he always had the ability to keep pace with the driver, like with any of the best on tour, he never lacked for that. You'd watch him in a group sometimes on the weekend, he'd be out driving the sort of preeminent big drivers that we, you know, sort of glom onto as those elite drivers. So happy to see it for him. And it was a, I guess even that next tier, right? Right. Pat, the, the, the tier that, in some ways we felt was maybe too low based on the field Um, behind the twenties really played great. Tommy, another great week. He's going to, he's going to maybe do it in Canada. Who knows? Uh, Maybe never. And Hatton little fantastic week for Ty, who sort of all those stats that sort of waned a bit are, are right back to where they were about six weeks ago after last week. Well, the performance, I mean, Tyrrell Hatton is Mr. Designated Event so far this season. 
He's come sixth in Phoenix, second at the players, fourth at API, and third at Wells Fargo. That's like six million bucks right there. Yeah. Good for him. And the fact that like a guy like Emiliano Grio can finish 35th and feel he does he's making too much money to even be here breaks my soul. But it's all part of the ecosystem. And speaking of that ecosystem that we're in right now, Pat, I joined our friend Andy Lack last week, and he made note as I, you know, um, when sort of going through the recent FINA resume, he seems to have perfected something that other golfers in his tier don't want to take part in. And that is like taking advantage of these of lesser events, bullying lesser fields. Um, very few players seem to want to do that like Tony, but all of a sudden it like guarantees him top places in in the FedEx Cup Tournament of Champions in some respects, and it gets him the wins that we wish maybe some other players would chase. Well, they changed the rules of the Tournament of Champions, too. If you make the FedEx, if you make East Lake, So I you, meant you Tour get... Championship. I meant Tour Championship. Yeah, but was, he, was it like he wasn't going to get into that? I mean, I put it this way. I have not looked at the FedEx Cup standings. Maybe we can do that right now and just see if there's any notable names that are, like, weirdly absent from everything. But I don't think that there are. Like, let's see. Who's on the outside of East Lake looking in right now? And you can always play yourself. Jesus, Mackenzie Hughes is still in East Lake right now. What a world. Jason Day is not inside the top 30. Neither is Hovland. Neither is Cam Young. Dietrich's up there. I haven't seen. When was the last time Dietrich played? I feel like he's we haven't. playing in this. He's the favorite in Europe this week. Oh, so he's back over in Europe for the moment? And hey, Dietrich played with uh, Vic Perez at the, the Zurich while you were on vacation. Ah. Not that you would notice or care, but for when he last played. I, I saw you cash a nice little ticket on our boy, the Polish Giraffe. He's He's got to be on the Ryder Cup team now, right? Oh, uh, yeah. His up and downs around that place. He's on the Ryder Cup team. Caught a little 25 to Moronk. Saw. I didn't even look much into it. I just saw he seemed pretty popular around the little landscape that we're in. And that 25 seemed really high. Um, at least when people were much smarter than me were saying you should bet Moronk. Thought you had bet him. I was I was upset when I sniffed your card and saw you didn't. Because yeah, you I, were even talking him up on, I, on the on, show uh, last week. On Monday, yeah. yeah. I'm an idiot. Yeah. I forget all this shit when I say it. it just yeah, Maybe I need to be more like you and make the bets as I go along, because then I'll actually remember to do them. But I'm too busy taking like time notes and shit like that. Thomas is 67th. Hideki's 69th, but he's been injured. He's back this week. So yeah, there are some big names that are out of it right now, but they always have the playoffs to get themselves back into it, and that's usually what happens. <laughs> And I don't even mean as much East Lake as I mean like a top ten spot at East Lake, and it's almost like um, getting yourself into those uh, DraftKings qualifiers. Um, no, not qualified. Those like super events, and I saw they're going to Detroit. They're doing a live event again, back in person. So that should be fun. Oh, that's into is it Detroit it, or Minnesota? Might have been Minnesota. Oh shit, that would be. I, I, I went to the three M a few years ago. It was a the TBC Twin Cities is fun. Although if, I you, saw Tam if you if you go with Moose, he'll just sit there criticizing it the entire time because it's not Hazeltine, but I enjoyed it. <laughs> <laughs> no, I, yeah, I guess you could. Yeah, there's a lot to pick a part of every golf course you've ever been to if you like go through it the eyes of not being Hazel Hazeltine. But hey, if you're lucky enough to just grow up a member at Hazeltine, you have that lens on the world of of golf courses. Um, that's that's a beautiful one. Um, I just saw Tambo tweeting that it seemed like they're doing a live event again at, at an actual event, which was something they did before. They may have even stopped doing it before the pandemic. It's all a blur now. What was the thing before the pandemic and what sort of become the norm, but it, they're DraftKings going back to that. So that seems like a cool perk or maybe some people hate it. I don't know. I'd like it. I would like it too. Maybe I'll just go see if DraftKings will fly us down. I mean, I'm not obviously not going to be qualified for it because I'm not good at this, but maybe they'll just give me a free ticket anyway. I can go schmooze with all the big players, try to learn something. You can like host the thing. I, I mean, I hosted the Fantasy Baseball World Championships. Paul was there. That was fun. Bales, that was in Vegas though, right? No, that was in New York. Bales tried to pay me a bunch of money to do a bunch of edibles before I got up on stage. I was like, yeah, probably get me fired. I probably shouldn't do that. <laughs> Probably shouldn't do that. But um, yeah, I don't know. I got off track there with Tony as we're here at another um, weak field event that Tony is not in. But like other players, he picked, you know, he picked 
Mexico, I guess, as a as a spot to rain, and it seems like Scheffler will pick this one. Well, it's not even Scheffler though. In the world, and when my I don't know what's the delay on my columns coming out, and I finished it last night. It's still not out yet, but I guess I can just maybe I shouldn't say it's in the column. I'll use it as an original thought right now. But in the in the <laughs> world of designated and elevated events that we've been seeing. The best spot you can have, it seems, if you're not one of those events, is going to be the week before a major, I think. At least for this week in the Canadian Open. Because this field isn't bad. It has top guys. This is the like, this is way better than Honda. This is way better than Pebble Beach. This is, I mean, Valero was the week before, but there had been such a concentration of elevated events during the month of... Uh, March that I think there was like four of them or something like that, that something had to fall by the wayside, but we saw it with Valspar as well. Like Valspar actually got a pretty decent turnout because it was so close in proximity. This being in Dallas really does help because there's so many of the Texas guys that obviously want to play, but just looking at it, like this is what I want from one of these weaker field events. You have like one of the top guys, two of the next tier guys, four of the next tier guys, then everyone else. Like that's a good field to me. Yeah, and this, I guess, has become like the Kenny Kim major, Pat, because someone informed me that apparently all the South Koreans live in Texas. That tracks, and if you just go back and look at the history of this tournament, like a lot of, at least in the recent past, since they moved, because they've moved twice from wherever the hell it was. Remember when Bill, I, I was reminiscing about this on the research show. I couldn't remember. I think it was 2017 during Jason Day's heater. Remember he missed that like two-foot putt in a playoff and Billy Horschel won? Remember Billy missing a two footer in a playoff, but I think that was a swing event. Um, I'll just chalk it up to yes. Okay, this is the stuff that really I, I, I must have had money on Jason Day because it really sticks out in my mind that this happened. But yeah, we had who won here? Sung Kang won this event when it was at that weird Trinity Forest. KH Lee has won back to back now. Like a lot of the Asian players just play really well with this course. I did see, I think it was Tom Jacobs put it out, and I noticed this. And I picked it up when I was doing the research show that guys that have had like a lot of success at uh, Riv have and Phoenix have played really well here too. I don't know if it's like a similar field crossover, but whatever it might be, you see a lot of the same names. Yeah. And I guess if you're performing well at those courses, you're pretty good golfer just to be in those fields. Um, I even get, though they have, a, I, I guess so. But like, the, the, I mean, KH Lee has won at minus twenty six and minus twenty five the past two years of the course. It seems like they would have nothing in relation to each other except for leaderboards. Yeah. And I, I don't know what I don't know what to make of it. Do you do you think that Colonial will end up having a pretty good field in two weeks' time after the PGA Championship? It always seems to bring out a strong field. And I'll tell you, Pat, the crunch between the PGA and the U.S. Open feels like it's tighter than even this one between the Masters, right? Well, it does because you have those two weeks that literally don't fucking matter on the PGA Tour. Like, I I'm good with it. Like, give them a bye week. Just have a bye week. Don't do the Zurich Classic. Do something else. Or do what the... Uh... LPGA just did. I, I mean, I really have no idea what the tournament was, but it just kind of started. I was watching the Golf Channel broadcast and it switched over into this like LPGA team event. And I know that we don't like to talk about stealing stuff from Liv. However, I think that there is an opportunity here. Instead of doing the Zurich Classic, maybe do one of these international tournaments. Uh, and you can break the U.S. up into like a bunch of different ones. You have like Team Texas, Team California, Team Florida, Team Rest of the U.S. to get more teams into it. But have the uh, the, the four-man teams where it's like you know, two single, you, get, you designate two guys to be singles players and you get to like one best ball team or whatever it might be or four ball team. And then you have like a bracket, like match play, but you play as a foursome. I think that'd be cool. I mean, I agree with you, but I would say they probably see Zurich as that already. But it's like not. A like, weird... make, make it match. Make no, it, make um... it match play. Okay, I don't disagree with anything that you're saying. Also, like just to the overall point, I, I forget. I think it was one of might have even been Mackenzie Hughes. That was like every sports like guys. There's like bye weeks, but. It's kind of weird to compare in the sense because, you know, they have their own schedules. They can play whenever they want. The tour is never going to turn off a week because look at who sponsors these events. Like, that's just the, the, the sponsors seem to be there. Now, you're right. It does seem like we're losing Honda, and I don't know that we've gotten our replacement, and 
maybe more will come. And maybe instead of trying to like force feed to find a new one, we just create a week off somewhere. I agree. But it seems like as long as CBS is going to put us on TV or NBC, and as long as one of these huge corporate corporations uh, want to be in business with us, like we are not going to turn that off, like period. Even if it is a quasi minor league weekend and they're not afraid to admit it and they'll say, don't watch, but they know there's enough evergreen. It's four o'clock on Sunday. I'm going to turn on the golf. It's two o'clock on the weekend. I'm turning on the golf. Like that's it. They like seeing people hit golf shots. It's true. And the most profitable thing that you can do in television is own live rights to sports. So the more live sports you can put on, the more profit, more profit is going to come to your company. I understand why they don't do bye weeks, but, and the Mackenzie Hughes thing is pretty ridiculous because yeah, you pick your own schedule. You can take a bye week whenever you want, whenever you don't want to play, I, you don't have to. Might not be, um, Mackenzie Hughes but uh yeah no can't I mean we've spoken about it a bit but the field for 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 the RBC the week before the U.S. Open looks a lot I would say stronger than this field it is because it'll have well it'll have all of team RBC which is who are the top end team RBC guys right now Connors and Cam Young and Connors Cam Young and Sahith is like a fun newer entity uh, so you have all of the Canadian players that are on, along with Cam Young and Thigala. Rory's going to play. Tommy always seems to play. Just there are guys that like playing the week before majors. Like that's, it's not so much before the Masters just because of the location and how much golf that you have to play coming up. But people have essentially been taking bye weeks since the Heritage. Maybe they came back last week. That was good. But is that enough of a two month? If you didn't like where your game was at last week, chances are you're going to play in this tournament. Yep. That's, that is also, um, that's also a pretty fair point. And L- Lowry and Fitzpatrick were the other good players who are going to be in Canada. So Sam Burns, Cooch, Webb Simpson, Cam Young, and Thie Gala are all the non-Canadian Team RBC guys. So they'll all be there. Throw Rory into that field. Yeah, it's already better than this one. Um, we shall see. And I'll tell you, I played, I got my first round out on the course on the weekend, Pat. Um the rough, like, I don't know whether the plan is to grow the rough so long and then rein it in, but it's rough that I've never seen on this property before. And I don't know how that equates to PGA Tour players, but to, you know, a membership that's essentially like old Jewish men, the course normally plays friendly. You know, it's like designed to play for, for membership. So it's a whirlwind out there. I'm... I'm losing balls where like, there's no goddamn reason to lose a ball here. I know exactly where I am. I've been here a hundred times on the flip side. I'm finding other people's balls like, cause they must've given up just like I gave up on some balls that are like eight feet off the fairway. I can't find a ball. I I don't know. It's crazy. We got a pouring rain yesterday. It's probably growing longer. Not to say the pros aren't going to rip snort it up, but for for a guy like me, I don't know, it was in some ways exhausting. I'll be perfectly. It was an exhausting experience. It's, it's funny you say that because when I actually did play Hazel Teen with Moose, it was like the day or two after the uh, women's U.S. Open. So all the rough was still up from that event. And I, I, I don't know how people play out of it. Hey, you don't know how like the the business guy who's a 15 handicap like wants that. Like, who's that appealing to well, no, other than to trot out guests? No, I like, I, I, say, I, I understand that, but it was just funny. Like, it's just me playing it with that rough, like the U.S. Open rough. Like, I had one play if I didn't hit the fairway, which was basically take out a lob wedge and try to hack it back into the oh. fairway because I wasn't going anywhere. <laughs> yeah, so that's exactly what I was essentially doing on um on Saturday or like fully account being my first um like round here of the year like I had no issues even just like I'm not doing that but I've played here my whole life and I love this 160 yard shot so you know where I'm picking up and putting my ball at that 160 yard shot that I love hitting on my club like because I just not what's the point what's the point of just hacking out sideways not like in a match yeah you're not like putting in the score in a computer it's not playing Tim heard you guys got out twice. We did. We got out on Friday and we got out on Sunday. So I'm in a 
weird predicament now because I'm playing against Tim and our other friend Tim in our season long matchups, all of our three way head to heads. But Tim is also on my team at the end of the year for the Ryder Cup. So I need to build him up because I need him to be better this year and not lose to the worst guy on the other team again. Okay. Here's the thing, though, Pat. You need to build him up before the Ryder Cup. Like, you've got time to beat the shit out of him to pick him on him now. Like, it's a roller coaster. If Tim was peaking early, I would be like, that's a horrible sign for the Ryder Cup, for your Ryder Cup. Like, you need him... It's way too early to, I mean, you need him to not be totally lost to see signs that he can maybe do it later in the year. But I think the worst thing for you would be like Tim coming out of the gates. Paul, you had a a comment on Tim's golf game? I think what Jeff's trying to say is like the old, the old saying of like, to really build him back up, you got to break him all the way down He was to his core. And then, and then maybe he'll stop buying like seven drivers a year. Oh, yeah. You know, doing little like tweaks on his two wood and all these other stuff. Like, so, so here has Tim bought any new clubs since you guys played golf this year? No, but he does have a new driver <laughs> from the off season. Yeah, he, he purchased it over the winter, and now he's playing with it. And uh, like when we talk but- about breaking him down and building him back up, last year was the breakdown. He was fucking terrible. I've been playing golf with Tim for about 12 years now, and it was the worst I've ever seen him play from beginning to end. It was the worst, like, scoring average he's ever had. He Like, we, I played rounds with him last year where on 14 drives with his driver, he would hit 13 into the woods or skull them or scuff them 50 yards in front of him. Like, no, not a single, like, even the worst people that I play with who are swinging as hard as they can at the ball every single time, like, two or three times around, they're going to fucking pump one. But he wasn't doing that. Yeah. But since we've started the new year on Friday and Sunday, I, he probably had like eight really good drives yesterday. He shot 97. He made three birdies. But like, he had, like he's playing the holes that he's playing well, he's playing well again. He's still making triple bogeys all over the place because he's losing balls on bad shots, that kind of thing. Well, that's match play. You just got to bring out that like one in every three out of him and you'll be fine. I- I'm just liking that I'm seeing that he's having good holes again. I was I had like a meltdown on 18 yesterday, though. I was having a good round. It's, it's a, I, my course, the it's the last... Well, I mean, it's the last hole, but it's a final par five. Uh, it's down a hill. You can get there in two. And I, I was amped, fucking crushed a drive. And then I was like, <laughs> all right, let's do this. Let's get there in two. And I just hit a bit of a slice and it hit, it hit the hill, the mound in front of the green. It trickled off uh, just behind the bunker on the right-hand side, but it's an elevated green. And then I scuffed it into the bunker, couldn't get it out of the bunker, couldn't get it out of the bunker again. And then just, you know, I'm, I'm hitting the fucking flag pin with my putter. I'm just absolutely losing my shit. It was not, it was not a great way to end a round. <laughs> a 10 from position a uh, it was actually a, an eight is what it turned out to yeah. be i made my putt <laughs> good um but yeah i guess yeah it's time to get golfing it's been raining a lot though man i bet you that course next week has gotten soaked i know they got the fancy irrigation and all that stuff there the sub air beautiful um beautiful fancy all that jazz but the amount of rain I'm not like this guy, like, oh, it's raining here. It must be raining there. But I am certain the weather that I have gotten has to be eerily similar over the past, like, month and a half winter that they got there. Well, it doesn't look like there's any rain in the forecast over the next seven days Good. in Rochester. Great. Fantastic. I, a PGA championship with wave integrity. Oh, my God. I love it. I love it. Yeah, not seeing... Uh, actually, that's not true. There looks like there's like a 3% chance of rain, a 12% chance of rain, but it's like mostly sunny. Scattered thunderstorms next Sunday. So on the final day of the PGA Championship, but that's also and, 14 days away, so it's probably not super accurate at the moment. Yeah, and Pat, I can tell you this. I uh, I don't know. I guess because um, I mentioned I was on with Andy last week and he's out in Rochester, so it's like in his backyard and he's jazz and like... He's like talking me up to come out there. And then I have this germ of idea in my head. And then I'd like talk through it for a minute, like one minute of conversation about it on his show. At least like 12 people DMing me like, am I going? I've got to go. And like, uh, I'll even like give you a room in our Airbnb. Like people like really wanting to like get me out there. And before I even realize it, like I'm like you, I think our kids have the exact same birthday. At least one of them. Like it's my 
like a minute before bringing it up to my wife, it dawned on me that I have a kid's, my own kid's birthday party that weekend. Yeah. Um, so that was a bit of a kick in the nuts. Uh, and I don't like that at times with a major championship, but yeah, I will not be at Oak Hill because I'm smart enough to not think I should be at Oak Hill. That, that is a smart move. Yeah, my son's birthday party, his uh, third birthday party, is going to be on the Saturday of the PGA Championship. So I'll have to like, tape that and go watch it later. Well, I'm at some sort of indoor playground trying to avoid the plague from all the other kids that are going to be there. Did you see much of this like Phil stuff that happened over the last week? I mean, yeah. I mean, it's hard not to see. He's tweeting a ton. And yeah. then I make a comment on Twitter acknowledging like, I'm pretty amazed Phil cares this much about Taylor Gooch. That's like, his, that, I don't that's, even... That's his teammate, man. They're on the same team. Phil right? is not a range goat. Oh, no. Is, is, I thought they were on the same team. I guess they aren't. I guess he just loves no, Taylor No, the range Gooch. goats is Bubba's team. Oh, that's right. Don't we have a big bet on them to win live? Some people made it. I, I, I do. I do have that bet. Okay, so then, yeah, that's a huge bet because Taylor Gooch is a wagon, right? Yeah. So the range goats. Well, Tim was. For them. Tim, Maybe I do have it. T- Tim was informing me about, you know, how it's just very unjust that Taylor Gooch is not. He's in the PGA Championship. He's not in the U.S. Open. I was like, yeah, I mean, I put it this way. If I was handing out exemptions, I would give him one. But unfortunately, that doesn't come to me. 100 percent and sort of uh i think this is the sentiment of a lot of people that i share like many i believe taylor gooch should be in the u.s open like many i will not miss him i don't honestly give a fuck that he isn't because what happened when all that shit went down i was like we were all sad to see players go But I'm certain we lamented Neiman and Gooch leaving more than DJ, more than Cam, more than Brooks, more than Phil. Why? Why? Exemptions. Exemptions, exemptions, exemptions. When you left without them, this was a very predictable outcome. It's unfortunate. But guess what? Old governing bodies in golf run by old white men are moving slowly because you try to disrupt them. I mean, that would be like, I don't know, like you breaking up with your wife, doing something horrible and then wanting like a good deal on a car from her car dealership owner, new husband. Like, I don't know, maybe they'll like give you the runaround or they'll jerk you around a little. And there's a hundred analogies you could think of, but this is just called life, Taylor. Looking at the- You live- took the money- they all took the money to give a new tour credibility. There are a lot of reasons, a potpourri of reasons why the checks were so big. One of those reasons, you can't dispute me on it, anybody, is that they were going to get shut out of legacy events, potentially. And that meant majors, that meant Ryder Cups, that meant President's Cups. Maybe not in the long-term future, but in the short-term future, legacy events were going to now have a question mark. Big question marks if you didn't have exemptions. In the Live Tulsa event this week, Gooch is the second favorite. He has shorter odds than Cam Smith and Dustin Johnson. He's on a, he's on a certified wagon. Uh, I haven't really looked at Live Tulsa other than to look at where Thomas Peters is, and we've now hit like 50, 60 to 1. Uh, that just seems to be a losing bet I make every week. Um, but if Cam or DJ get it going this week then why then like i think our brains will all sort of think they'll do what brooks did leading into the masters in some respects credit to brooks his peas his peas are up on the leafs 3-0 baby brooks was in toronto last week some of my buddies in the nice part of the arena ran into him at at the acc yeah how uh how are you like i sent you a pic Oh, yeah, that's right. I forget stuff all the time. How are your friends dealing with the uh, the emotional collapse that they're seeing on the ice? It's it's toxic, Pat, because <laughs> this 19-year drought ended. And then the next night, the bracket just opened up for them with Boston losing and teams losing all around, the Rangers everywhere. And then they woke up the next morning as cup favorites. <laughs> and the gods were just like, no, 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 no. 
And not only no, no, not, no, 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 not no, no, only no. cup favorites, but Paul, I mean, you can you you're on the group thread with all your Leafs buddies too. But just what I would hear from Leafs fans about how like, oh, this is this is just it. Not only are we favorites, of course we're going to win. Like you people watch the same shit every year. You don't realize this is going to happen to you. It blows my mind. Like you don't learn ever. waiting for paul oh. I, I finally like picked it my, my dad my entire life you know he had watched the leafs he'd been let down by the leafs he's just like paul don't let your this loser franchise get into your heart so he was a leafs fan he wanted them to win but he expected them to lose and like i always thought he was kind of like you know out there and that it was like a horrible strategy it's like the last five years i brought that into my life and i'm trying to impart that wisdom on my group chat that is in extremely toxic this morning like i dropped like the dog like flashback cupcake uh gif in there after i saw what was being said they want everyone fired it's uh i mean i have enough heartbreak with the bills in my life that i don't need the leafs to also let me down every year my, my so. dad my story is this identical to paul's and my dad was like there. He was there in 67, like at the game. He told like I was a I was a rabid, like Leafs insane teenager. And he was like, they're they're just breaking your heart. They're just gonna break your heart. And then yeah, finally I got into my 30s somewhere and I was like, I can't let them break. In the way I haven't been able to with the Chargers, I was like, emotionally, I will not let them break my heart again. Um, so I'm good. I'm in that safe space where like, I'm happy for them and everyone around me when they win, but when they lose, I can take such a, mo I can like emotionally, I'm not attached and I can see the humor in how people emotionally attached are like I would be with the chargers always clearly. As Paul pointed out before the show, everyone can have one loser franchise in their life that they are emotionally attached to having two becomes problematic. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, yeah. So you got to give one up. You, gotta, you, gotta, you have to kill one of these addictions somewhere. We put it off long enough. We should probably talk about this tournament, the Byron Nelson. I was wrong uh, in saying that it was a par 72 at 7,468 yards because I just chose to believe what the PGA media site was telling me. I just clicked on the scorecard, and what does it tell me? Oh, number 12, the easiest hole on the course, has been shifted from a par 5 to a par four it is now a par 71 not that that really makes a difference i mean guys are going to shoot what they're going to shoot but maybe we don't get to minus 26 it's now minus 22 instead because number 12 was just kh lee made a bunch of eagles on that hole i believe last year i think he made two of them speed birdied it every single day like you know there's minus four anywhere between minus three and minus six guys were adding to their score because of number 12 guys are still going to birdie it obviously but you know w the optics of it although the scores won't actually change the optics of it when you see minus 21 versus minus 27 here you're like oh this isn't as much of a birdie fest as i thought so i uh, just throwing that out there in case people were wondering why i had it written up as a par 72 and when i talked about it as a par 72 this change kind of came out of nowhere i suppose because the pga media site didn't even update it but uh, this has been a pretty easy tournament uh over the years it's going to be a scoring fest putting well you need to be good on the greens you don't need to be like the gaining 12 strokes and in, in order to win this event you need to be pretty solid off the tee very good on your approaches and gain a few strokes putting and you should be good and that brings us to the top of the board this week there's co-favorites uh i underestimated how heavy these favorites were going to be when I guessed the odds. I had Scheffler at six to one, but he is currently four and a half to one at DraftKings Sportsbook. I thought Spieth would be 10. He is nine to one at DraftKings Sportsbook. And then Tyrrell Hatton is 14 to one. Those are your three favorites in the field this week at the Bunny Ranch. Probably not going to bet any of these guys and just hope for the best. Yeah, and that was the strategy in Mexico didn't really work out nope. in some ways it does feel the same with how the price the top top is priced like this feels like rom finau scheffler spieth although it does feel like the next tier is a bit stronger here than it was in mexico right at least this was the next tier in mexico was wyndham clark two weeks ago not yesterday not this morning two weeks ago uh 18 to 1 and i also probably bet losers in mexico near in that oh I bet Gary Woodland at what 35 to 1, 
some loser number in Mexico. Um, so the back, the second tier definitely feels stronger here. I like you will, will pass. At it's for now. It's worth remembering. Yes. Scheffler is the best player in the world. And if he decides to show up and putt, he's probably going to win. I think we should all acknowledge that he was the only player in the top 15 of this tournament last year who actually lost strokes putting. But I think that people forget that Scheffler didn't win after the masters last year because dude couldn't putt to save his life. And we're starting to get that already this year is that he went through his hot stretch. But once you see him gain strokes once on the green, just start betting him every single week, as it turns out. Because he's going to ride that for like six weeks, and then he's going to revert back into the guy that can't make a three-foot putt. So the crazy win streaks. It's more cow- I mean, winless. Morikawa, JT, Scheffler. Is anyone else should be in there? What do you mean, Scheffler? Sorry. You tripped me for a moment because obviously won again. You said he didn't win for a year. No, he didn't win for a year, but at he won the Masters last year, and then he didn't win again for the rest of the year. And then he won in Phoenix, obviously. Yes. And then he won yes. again he won at the, the players. players. <laughs> yes, yes, that's why it sounded weird saying apologies. This, yeah. but you can see, like the putting wasn't disastrous at Heritage, but he still lost. And in a tournament like that, you're gonna have to gain strokes putting. Like it's, I mean, I guess Spieth didn't the year that he won, but this was an elevated event. If you're not gaining strokes against the best players in the world, you know, someone someone else is going to have a pretty good week. That's eighty percent of your ball striking week and actually make a few putts, and that's going to be the difference. But he came eleventh. He came tenth at the Masters, and like, dude was legitimately terrible on the greens. He broke even at the players, and his ball striking was so good, he ended up winning. He almost Almost won the match play, but again, the short putting really let him down. It just feels like this is a tournament where you can get got in a situation like that if you're not, like, if you're missing three, four footers throughout the course of the week or one per round, something like that, which is essentially what he's been doing. Like, that's going to be enough at a birdie fest like this to sink you and not, I'm not saying sink you in terms of miss the cut, but sink you to the fact that you're not going to get to minus 25. Yeah. So like, it's almost the argument you're making now is like, you could do again when people want to discuss Adam Scott at like 35. Well, well, Adam Scott can putt though. Like you're still thinking this has been, you're you're still thinking this is Adam Scott from like five years ago. He's pulled a Webb Simpson on his career. Dude putts well now. (laughs) I love Adam Scott. I've been vouching for the guy forever, but I just mean it does still, even though Adam Scott is now putting, there's, I, yeah, I feel he, bad for him because the PGA has got his yips on promoted tweets at the moment. Oh, do they? Yeah, it's not fair. That's not fair. Yeah, not fair. Also, to, not fair uh, a Scott. sports network in here sent me a promoted tweet this morning of the Leafs going up two nothing in the first period of game two. So, oh, really? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, there's a weird thing with the Twitter promotional tweets because I looked into it at one point. And like to you know, like when we had Schefter on last year for the Masters, like really promote that out. But like it didn't take effect right away. Then you had like a you had to like pick the length of the campaign. I was like, I just want this to be promoted right now for like the next four hours. But it didn't work like that. So I just never did it. So okay, so that makes sense. That's why sometimes you see insane things. But obviously, it's just the campaign, Pat. It's, it's weeks long. Yeah, exactly. I thought Adam Scott had Adam Scott's won this tournament before, right? Not at this course, obviously. In, in full disclosure, that was the guy that I was talking about before the before the show that I bet on was Adam Scott. Love Adam Scott. Koreans, Aussies, like and, and Adam just, Scott. We could do we could do the show with Koreans and Aussies and and forget everyone else once we've done talk done talking about the top. Yeah, he won this in two thousand and eight. So yeah, I've seen it as high as what thirty five to one. What was your what? What did you play? I bet it at thirty. I bet it at thirty five to one. So he's a part of this yeah. next collection of guys. I mean, Hatton's been playing great. Right. Fourteen to one. Just it, it's a bit short for me. Spieth at nine to one. Like, there's a reason that these guys are favorites. One of these like five guys are probably going to win. But I'm just trying to make. If you're not going to bet on Scheffler, you need to have some sort of reason not to do it. I mean, the odds suck. That's one thing. But if he keeps winning, you should bet him at the odds anyway. But the fact that he's not making these putts does worry me a little bit in a tournament like this. And the same thing with Spieth. Although Spieth's putting has been a lot better, he's just been so like whip like just. I don't know what the hell happened to him. He was playing great until the 18th hole on Thursday, and it's like that hole ruined his week when he went double water. I couldn't happen to a better guy. So Hat- he's a great guy. I just don't care. Like, and we we, we always- playing great. I don't cheer. For, uh, 
I'm not cheering for him. I don't bet him. I don't really cheer for him. I'm cheering for him at the PGA Championship. I'd like to see him win there and Cree get the career grand slam. I always find like milestone achievements are good for the game. And I do like Spieth, but we have always found, I don't know what his track record is at this course. I believe he was second last year, but didn't we always say that this was a tough one for him? Cause he's a Dallas guy, just the commitments he has to do. He's also an AT&T sponsored golfer. This is the AT&T Byron Nelson. That's just one of those events that it just seems like he has so much off the course stuff to do. He's almost like an ambassador to this tournament that there's not a lot of time to really focus on golf. Yeah. I would say of all the scheduling spots in the tour, this being the week before Spieth's de- um, flirt with historical destiny, greatness, all-time pantheon is really unfair to him. Now, like, boo-hoo, cry, tear for Spieth. I just told you I don't even care to see him win. But it's a lot going into what is probably, like, the biggest event almost for the year for him outside of the Masters now. Like, right? That's, like, in terms of a preparation trying to peak standpoint. So it's a lot. Um, He seems to rise to this, though, in some ways. I'm not counting him out. I just have no interest in betting him at at 17. I'd rather bet like Hatton at 16 than Spieth at 10 if I was playing in this lower part. Yeah, I think those are pretty bad odds on Hatton as well. I mean, this is an elevated event. How could he ever do well? He only does well in those events. So those are the three at the top. Are you worried that... I mean, with a player like Hatton, doesn't this event just like totally neutralize what he does best? I mean, at the moment, he's sort of he's in the spell of being really good in, in multiple phases. But don't you want Hatton where there's like a bit of a grind element and you're happy to even like take 30 more points or something? I don't know about that. I mean, he's he won like those birdie fests over in Europe for years. Yeah, you're right. He's won those Dunhill links, um, which are pro-ams, which are true, like, birdie, absolute birdie parades. So yeah. you're right. So, like, he won. I like him up. He won the he won the Dunhill back-to-back, minus 23, minus 24. He won the Italian Open at minus 21. Abu Dhabi at 18. Tur- at the Turkish event at minus 20 in that, like, 30-man playoff, which was hilarious. He won the B. He won at Wentworth at minus 19. Or, so. um, of, of the players under 20, is actually my favorite, as high as you could possibly get him. I'm not sure what that is. I don't know if people are betting him. Um if he somehow got to 20, maybe I'd be interested, but that sounds really he, stupid because I see 17 and I wouldn't really let that sway me. He, he, is, not, he is not getting to 20 this week unless he like breaks a leg during the pro-am and then still decides to play. So the next tier of guys, Day is 16, Tom Kim is 20, KH Lee and Hideki are both 22. Then you have Adam Scott at 30, this is all at DraftKings Sportsbook, by the way. Montgomery, Flea Market at 35, along with Min Woo! Lee. Matt Kuchar, then you have Siwoo, Seamus Power, Mav McNeely, all 40 to 1. So that's the range. I like Adam Scott. Like I said, I bet him at 35. I see Hideki as high as 25 or 24. I forget what it was, but I think I might just bet that. Like, I know he's been off since the Masters with this neck problem, but previous to that, he had been really good in trending upwards, especially in terms of ball striking. He was really good at this tournament last year. He led everyone in approach, and yeah, maybe he's rusty, Maybe he's injured, but I feel like in this tournament, with this field, with the experience that he has here and the form that he previously had, the rust and the injury are baked into this price. It's a good price for relatively speaking in this field. Yeah, so I agree. It's probably the fairest price that um, we saw this morning for, for a few reasons. That being said, I feel like Hideki often plays the week before a major. He does. Or at least tries to. Yeah. And it's almost like he just wants to make sure his like limbs are there and his muscles are fine. Sure. That's- but you said that's baked into it. Like the Hideki bit of a seesaw that is Hideki. You're right. That's baked into seeing a 24 to one. And he played this. this he, he played this Hideki. tournament last year before the PGA championship and came third. And he hadn't played previous yeah. like and he hadn't played since the Masters that last year either. Yeah. And going into this, he was fifth of the players. He played the week before the Masters at Valero, came in 15th, and another really good tee to green week. Just didn't really make any putts. Uh, You were here. We were watching that one together uh, when he kept, when he 
shorted himself on that par three, and that was the end of his day. He actually had like a really bad final round. And then he was 16th in the Masters, and the ball striking was really good again. So and then he took the time off, skipped to designated events with a neck injury. So hopefully he's okay, but he was fine enough at the Masters. I don't disagree with your like first instinct assessment. Forget it. Yes, Wyndham did win an elevated field last week, but yeah, I'm trusting Scott, trusting Hideki. Doesn't seems fine. I saw the the Tom Kim approach numbers were back last week. It seemed Pat, and that's um that that seems to be a great sign for him on a course that should suit him beautifully. I agree. As high as as high as what? There's a 24s. There's some early morning 28s. Oh, well, I don't think I don't think those are around. Tom Kim at 24, I could be talked into. You don't have to twist my arm on Tom Kim. The only one I'm officially on is Adam Scott, but I could go Tom Hideki, Adam Scott, a bomb or two, and call it a week. Yeah, yeah, you could you could certainly make that work. I mean. Here's the thing where I, I don't like really care. I don't know why I'm even mentioning it again, but we're off a bit of a in modern in our current status, a long shot off of um, an elevated event going to a course that has rewarded a couple KH Lee monsters. Uh, but I'm with you in terms of like pricing my card inside that range and just banking on good players that you want to trust. I mean, that's how I build my cards. How about KH? I lose, K- I lose plenty, though. How about KH Lee at 22 to 1? No. <laughs> if he gets me, he gets me, but hell no. That's those are such terrible odds. Uh, who was the last guy to win three in a row? Was it Stricker at the John Deere? Burns went for it at Valspar this year. Almost um, got Rory's there go, Rory's going for it in Canada, which would be even crazier because it'd be three different courses. And um, so and and two no tournaments because COVID canceled two of them, didn't they? Yeah. So I don't even know how to quantify that. Three in a row at the identical layout. Um, that'd be something, but I'm not paying to find out. In real time, Aaron Wise has vaulted himself up to 40 to 1. This is the first time we've seen Aaron Wise in months. He was taking a mental health break from golf. This is the tournament of his only career win, obviously not at this course, when he got go- he got ghosted by his girlfriend after the win. Wouldn't come in for the old smooch after he got the $1.4 million check, but he's back. I don't know if I, like, I feel more confidence. I mean, I would feel more confidence in Hideki anyway because he's a much better player, but I have zero idea where Aaron Wise's game is at. I don't know if he's touched a club in three months. I just can't bet it. It'd be a lovely story. Good for him. Um, you went on Cooch? I'm not here. Mm, where are we on the odds here? 35 um, to 1. Okay, so speaking of Cooch, like when you look back at, yes, KH Lee won these last two. And for me, I don't really know what to take from that. So I try to look at the other players who have played well here, right? And and, um, you see Cooch and you see Kodaira, and that allows me to think um, like any sort of player profile can, can make it rain here. They're not long par fives. Almost anyone can get to them in two. The drivable par fours, depending on where they have the tee boxes that day, I think almost anyone can get to them. The longer hitters may have a shot at both of them, depending on where the tees are at those days, but it doesn't really seem to hurt Kuchar. This is the easiest birdie or, birdie or better percentage course on tour inside 125 yards. So if you can get it to 125 yards and in, you're probably going to have a good chance of making birdie. And we know that Cooch is pretty deadly from that range. But I think that his last two starts are a little bit misleading. He came 19th at Heritage and he came 23rd last week at Wells Fargo. You know, really good results. He lost strokes off the tee and approach last week and gained over 11 between chipping and putting. Not exactly what you want to see in terms of form coming in. And at the Heritage, he was 19th, but again, lost two strokes on approach and gained over six between chipping and putting. He gained over six between chipping and putting at Valero when he came third as well, but hit his irons really good that week. It's been all chipping and putting for him, which is great and everything. If he has to chip that much, it's going to be a problem here. Well, if anyone has to chip much at all, it's going to be a problem here. Like if you got a, I don't doubt you'll need some clutch weekend par saver to keep momentum or something 
and you've always got to have that in your bag to win a golf tournament. But yeah, if you're not, if you're not, um, if you're playing around the greens, you're just done. You're going backwards simply for just being there, even making your par. Min Woo Lee, Pat, because oh. I have a problem. He really hurt my feelings at the Masters when he drove that green and five putted. But I, it felt like he probably felt, although he kept his composure a lot better than I did, of what happened to me in my last hole on Sunday is what happened to Min Woo Lee at number three in the first round of the Masters. Yeah. Um, so that was a bit of a, a rough, a rough time. And that continued at the RBC heritage. So, you know, the recent isn't delightful, but when I open them up, you know, someone that's kind of been addicted, he had a horrible Arnold Palmer, probably his worst event of the year. And then he came back the very next event and finished sixth place at the players. So, it's a bit of a yin and yang here, and I'm all about. I'm just addicted to what I think he's capable of. Um, he's not Aussie, right? It's New Zealand. I mentioned Aussies and Koreans. That's who has my eye this week. We've spoken about Kim. We've spoken about Scott. Um, Minwoo Lee, very close. I'm seeing a 45 to one. It's it's almost calling my name too hard. Uh, Min Woo Lee is Australian, by the way. And even at the sixth place finish at the players, he dropped eight strokes on approach. He just made every putt. Let's not forget well, it's that. Good to know that. It's good to know that's in the bag. I, I agree. I agree. But listen, you can talk. If it's a golf bet, you want to talk yourself into the positives, not really think about the negatives all that much. I'm on board with trying to do some things like that. But in power ranking from this range, it's going to be Scott Hideki. I'm, I'm going to bet Hideki at 24. And I'll try to get there on Tom Kim. That's probably where I'm looking this week. All right, and then you got a bomb. You got it like a hundred to one for us. I don't know. I mean, that's what I'm going to talk through. We can go to, to forty to one plus at this point see, to see, see what we're doing down here because I like Spawn seems like he's been playing, yeah, pretty well. Bazaden out rates out great for me. Seventy to one. I might bet him. Uh, Bezaden Hote 70. I'm even staring at an, that an 80 enhanced, but you might want your placings there. Yeah, I, I um, would want placings with Bezaden Hote. So, I, I mean, I, like you said, how you have sort of in your head, or maybe you've already got them in the pendings with Scott and Hideki and what you're thinking of else, you've created this card. And, um, I like it because what you are essentially doing, Pat, is saying, Eh, Steven Yeager, you're nice, but I'm not betting you. Davis Riley, you had your win, and then you looked horrible last week. I don't know what to make of you. Bezaden Hope pass, Brantlett pass. Brandon Wu, who I'm actually swimming around at 80 to 1, Pat. Not going to lie. Um, but you're just telling all these guys, like, fuck off. No card. No moss. Yeah, I think so. Like, do you, do my, Brandon Wu, like, can you give me, can you give me the SJ on? Brandon Wu? Well, it's it's a couple guys here. It's Brandon Wu. It's even um, Justin Su. Okay, why? Well, Justin Su, like, he seems to excel everywhere but around the green. And if that doesn't matter, I don't want to say it doesn't matter, but that is something that um, his perform a string of nice missed cuts uh, from the fifth at Honda. He hasn't missed the cut. He has six the players. Six of, yeah, he's fifth, he's been, fifth at Honda, six of the players, and 45th, 73rd, and 59th. He's been horrible. He, and his strokes gain have been abysmal, but he's he's getting it done on the on the putter right now. He's been really hot, and he's a player who's historically been pretty strong with the approach play. Who's in a rough spell at the moment, clearly. Yeah, Seems. he he dropped 15 strokes tee to green at the Heritage. That's not good. He dropped seven last week. He is making all these cuts because he's – Geez, over his past five events, see, like he's gaining an average of three and a half strokes per event on the greens. Like he's putting his way to the cut and then absolutely collapsing as soon as he makes the cut. I, I agree with you. I, I like Sue's talent. I just don't know whether this is the form where I want to back him or not, If especially if I'm going to go with three guys somewhat near the top of the board. But Zayden Hout, I said I liked. At least he comes in in pretty good form. That That's why I ended up kind of siding with him. And beyond that, just like looking at the – the guy's short term that I can go with, like Mark Hubbard, maybe he had a hole in one last week. It's good enough. Yeah, bogeyed it the day before. Might have even doubled it the day before. Um, I may, I may, back, I, 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 I might go back to Sam Stevens as well. 
Like, I thought he acquitted himself pretty well uh, at Wells Fargo last week. I don't love his odds this week, but I thought he was fine. He got himself through the cut line, you know, played a pretty tough course. He gained tee to green. He just lost strokes putting. And he's a shitty putter, so that makes a lot of sense. But the weeks that he has putted well, uh, gained six at Valero, came in second, gained three, five and a half at Farmers in three rounds. Like when he's putting well, he putts really well. When he putts poorly, like he's normally a pretty shitty putter. But like this is the difference between like him on the greens and someone like Luke List on the greens. This is more what I would call like the JB Holmes zone of holy shit, he gained eight strokes putting. He had lost seven in every event before he came in. Like it feels like there's no middle ground with him. It's they're really good, but most of the time it's really bad. That if you can catch him on one of the really good weeks, he's got a shot to win. And I mean, that just comes into that whole like sort of macro way of how you like to maybe people like to bet outrights. You just sort of have that different view where like shitty player with the ability to spike um, is sometimes better than that like status quo around the board, you know, like, you know, no true weakness, but doesn't do anything great can't win yeah like hubbard's at 90 i was looking at like cole again ben griffin again i don't know if i'm going to get to those guys but there's no one from like really down the list would you go with pearson cootie he's a texas guy isn't he he was pretty bad last week not that that would change anything of mine there was someone shoot just in front but no i wouldn't really care much for pearson cootie um So I opened up someone else. I wanted to talk myself into talking up SH Kim. Dude, this course is way too easy for SH Kim. Yeah, it might be um, to that point. He's in a rough place with his approach game at the moment. Yeah, he's a scrambling man. You get him at a course where I mean, people hit 71% of greens regulation at this course. Get him at a course that has like a 50% green regulation rate, and all of a sudden he could be there. Do you have any love for Siwoo here? Yes. Sorry, I mentioned Koreans, Aussies. That's a guy we certainly didn't didn't talk about. Uh, what, I'd argue anything like above 40? 40 seems like it's not a horrible price if you want to take a spin on, on the uh, on the, on the Siwoo wheel. He was striking the ball incredibly well until Sunday. And then the approach game just went in the tank. He lost over two strokes on approach. But I bet him live at like 400 to one going into Saturday. I was like, if anyone's going to make a move here, it's going to be Siwoo. Like looking at his numbers, like the, the driving was great. The approach numbers were great. Dude just couldn't make a putt to save his life. He started to putt a little bit on Saturday. And I think he must have had a couple of those chips where he chipped to the top of the hill and it just rolled back to his feet because I've never seen him lose so many strokes in one round around the green. Like it was unbelievable. Yeah, I mean, and it shows last week, even for Si Wu, who can be hot and cold, he lost three and a half strokes putting last week. It's been almost like uh, since Phoenix. So he's been in the hard green, Pat, with putting. Yeah. He gained five strokes in Phoenix putting and has subsequently not gained a stroke in what seems like six events, although the Masters might have actually been kind to him. But that would be perception based and not I have no stat to um do you to give there? Yeah, I don't mind um, Siwoo. You could maybe even convince yourself, like I don't like Siwoo at forty versus Tom Kim at twenty four. Like I don't know if that's a decision um, for you with how you built your card, but yeah, Koreans and Aussies, Kim, Siwoo, Scott, Jason Min Day. Woo. You didn't we make... really talk about Day. I'm not betting him. I, I don't like the odds. I, I need him deeper than that. If Day wants to go out and win, I'm there for it. It'd be like if Ricky won last week. It's like there was just no chance I was touching those odds. There was a longer shot player. I, he must can't be that important because I forget. In terms of the short-term numbers I'm looking at, um, oh, my guy Carson Young rates out really well. I keep betting that guy. He missed a cut on the number last week. Stupid Carson Young, but rates out really well. Been putting well. Uh, he didn't drive the ball all that well last week, which is kind of an anomaly for him. He generally drives it really well, uh, but the ball striking has been good. The putting has been good. I don't even know what his odds are. What are his odds? Carson Young, 300 to one. So he might make like a, a top 20 or like a $5 each way or something like that for me. Um, and Kevin Roy in honor of Sakai. Have you, are you caught up on succession yet? Nope. That's but I love it. I'm just not yeah, it's, caught it's, up. It sounds like you love it. 
No, I I really do. I'm I'm in the moment here. Ah. Uh, Lashley? I'm going to I'm going to build a card like you. Maybe not the same players, but that is like where my money's going. That's sort of how I build it regularly. Uh but I am like now in this moment of my morning pat where I'm staring down like losers at 80, like Justin Sue, now uh Bramlett. Like guy seems like um does everything well, just uh putt. But no, why waste a cent? Why waste a cent? What about Nasty no. Nate? Nasty Nate was up there going into the weekend. He's another guy who like does really well in Phoenix. Played this tournament pretty well too over the years. Yeah, he's playing all around the board. He's he's quite um Nate. He's quite strong. 110 have... to 1. And where's ba- Batia's playing, isn't he? I don't think so. I thought I, I think he originally he was in the field. Akshay, nah, he's not on the betting board. He was he's living he, that new life. He's living that new life of elevated. Now he's got he's basically secured his tour card for next year. Almost, I'd have to think. I would think so. Um oh wow. Seen a lot of buzz for Davis Thompson, so I had to open it up and it's like I just ran a red light. Davis Thompson. He was number one T to green last week. Was he really? Missing the cut. Davis Thompson. Last week at the Wells Fargo gained one stroke T to green. Maybe that's what you're thinking of. That's not a ranking. That was his total. Yes, yes. Sorry, sorry. Yes, I know that. That is the stroke number. <laughs> you're, I'm just you, trying to figure out what you almost gave me a you almost gave that. me a stroke number by saying that. Yeah, he hasn't been good since no. the American Express. He no. had the he had the yeah, pass. Yeah, pass. hard pass on Davis Thompson. All right, I, th- I, th- I think we've talked this through enough. So let's get to the quick picks for the Byron Nelson. Uh, should I don't know if the numbers out there or not because I didn't check, but I still have that hundred and twenty-five to one on Keegan Bradley for the PGA Championship at Oak Hill. If there's a cool place you can bet, maybe you can still find that number out there. Uh, otherwise, I believe it's like sixty to one. Probably get a better number a week of if you do want to bet on Keegan Bradley than the sixty. It'll probably go to like eighty or ninety or something like that. I doubt that it gets higher than one hundred and twenty-five though. So for me, Hideki and Scott twenty-four and. 35. Uh, I got both Kims on the short list with Siwoo and Tom Kim. I'll have all my final wagers available in the newsletter on Mayo Media. Might even have the uh, PGA Championship Listeners League link in there as well uh, if you want to get first crack at that. Other than those guys, Stevens, Bezadenhout, and Nasty Nate Lashley will find their way onto my card in some capacity, whether it's a top 10, an outright with an each way, a top 40. I don't know how I'm going to especially finagle Carson Young as well. I got 300 to one. There's many possibilities that you can have with him, but those would be the guys that I'm looking at this week. The only ones that I'm firmly on in terms of my money is in on them, Hideki and Scott. Um, Tom Kim, betting Tom Kim, and I'm betting Minwoo Lee. Those will be bets that are being made. Um, Other than that, maybe I'll, see myself getting in on one of Hideki or Scott trusting the elite player I think I'd rather roll the dice with Hideki but uh, that'll be a decision Siwoo also in there there's really no I don't know I tried to talk myself into a, a not good player to have a moment like I got to where I mentioned Brandon Wu and Bramlett but no I'm just gonna pass I'm gonna pass but one- losers next week one and done selections for the Byron Nelson. Gus is starting to run away with this on us. This is not good. He is at $5 million. I'm at 3.7, and you're at 2.6. So we need to make a comeback here. Cust is taking, want to make a guess? Mm, Spieth. K.H. Lee. Oh. This would be a week. like him trying to... This would be like a, this would work out well for him because no one's going to bet KH Lee at 22 to 1. And then Cust will be the only person that gets any sort of credit if he wins again. Good for Cust. I'll be happy for him. Um, I'm taking Scott. Who do I take? Okay, I'll take Tom Kim. Tom Kim. Okay. T Kim for you for the one and done. All right. They'll do it on the Pat Mayo experience. You're getting ready. Have you done any Oak Hill research whatsoever yet? 
I started to watch some flyovers and I thought I was getting like course preview, but I ended up getting stuck. I could have just changed the video, but I ended up getting stuck in like a history of Oak Hill. Oh God. I know. I know. Why didn't I just like stop and continue my journey to find what I was looking for? So yeah, I know all about that and the nursery and how they grew the trees. Then they got rid of the trees. So very helpful stuff is what you've been digging into. The useless stuff. Like, I would be perfect. Like, the useless stuff that some, like, CBS, like, producer's assistant is forced to do is what, like, I did on my own free will. That's horrible to say out loud. I got... I, I'm... Like, I'm uh, on the email list for PGA of America because I've done some work for them in the past, and they've been sending out these emails over the past few weeks. Like, get ready for the PGA Championship. Here's what you need to know about Oak Hill. And, like, I'll click on it, and it's exactly the same shit. It's like, I don't need to know this. Like, give me some, like, viable information about, like, what's the scorecard? Why don't you tell me that? That'd be nice. But no, that's not what we're getting. Do you have any, any, um, like, you swimming around anybody? Or it's all just like they're all sort of clumped and whoever gives me the best number of the clump. It's difficult to say because I think that looking at the past, I went back and watched some of the PGA Championship from last time around. I probably should have watched you know, the one from the time before as well. Maybe I'll do that during the week. But it's difficult to really parse because I think when you look at it, that you see Furick and Duffner and some of the other names that were at the top of the board last time around that you're like, okay. I can see a path here. Accuracy, good wedges, good irons, maybe not the strongest putters, but can putt well enough. But it does seem to be critical that you hit the center of the fairway uh, and on some very thin fairways because you can start making big numbers if the rough plays up. And we've seen the PGA of America make the PGA Championship a lot tougher over the past like seven years or so than what it had previously been. They're kind of upping it like a U.S. Open uh, to make it that sort of difficulty. So I almost want to take everyone out who doesn't drive the ball straight or at least doesn't have the capacity to hit the ball straight. But these players are so different and so good now that, I don't know, like is it, am I better off taking a, let's say, a Tom Kim or a Morikawa? Or a Sungjae. Three guys that I know that are most more than likely going to be in the fairway. They're the best of the good players in terms of driving accuracy. And we know that they can hit their irons really well, too. That's all great. So do we go with those guys and that type of player because that's what's worked here in the past? Or is Scheffler and Rom just going to be, ah, fuck it. I'll just drive it 350 and hit a wedge out of the rough like Bryson did uh, at the U.S. Open that year. And that worked. Yeah, so I got to admit, I'm more like looking at that Sung J, plug my nose like Xander kind of profile, just like straight arrows around the place. Okay, because the numbers are better on those guys. Is why? Yeah, I guess. Yeah, but you know, I should just pay. Last last major, I gave a card to like five guys and said it's a lot of names for someone who just thinks John Rahm is winning the golf tournament. You know. Sure. I don't feel the same. I guess I don't. I don't know. Yeah, I'm same. excited for it. For and and Tim will try to take a victory lap on me next week, friends. He will try to take a victory lap on me because eight years ago I said the PGA Championship is the low rent of majors. It's at the very end. No kid in Europe pretends they're hitting a putt to win it when they're ten, and no American-born kid, unless you're Justin Thomas, whose dad did that thing, is is doing that either. It's U.S. Open. It's a Masters putt in your imagination. But unlike Tim, unlike Tim, I admit when I'm wrong, I use like what's happened and be like, whoa, holy shit. This time frame that Pat's speaking about, the course selection they have given us, the Sunday entertainment they have delivered, the, the scheduling time of year, check mark, check mark, check mark. Love this event. Like I, I, I love a major, great. But like the PGA Championship has elevated itself in my head only, maybe others, but so much in the last, like, since we started doing our show, Pat. I was just scanning my numbers here. Michael Thompson rates out really well this week. I don't know why. Jimmy Walker in Texas? The Jimmy Walker Assance? Is that a name for you? What's that guy? Five million to one? Not horrible. 100, 125. Um... Mm, that's not enough. What's Chuck Hoffman? Oh, wow. 
This isn't the Valero. But yeah, but it's he's, Texas. he's Mr. Texas. I'm seeing. Oh, I no, no. Now I'm not in that odds part of the page. Maybe Hoffmania will start to run wild. I, I don't even know if he's in the field because he's not popping up on the odds sheet. Oh, that's for the PGA Championship. That would be why. Let's see here. Byron. And Nelson, is everyone Hoffman? Better. Hoffman's 100. And that's it. 130 is the same odds as EVR. Oh, no, thank you on that one. Smother Man, 180? This is more of a DraftKings discussion, I think, that I'll have with Tampa. What about Aaron Rye? Everyone, first round leader like King. He's 110. Maybe you just look at him for first round leader. I should actually bet it instead of talking about it and watching him like up there every Thursday. Did, did Batia get into the PGA Championship, do you know? I've not seen that. I just want that guy to win. Love that guy. He's great. Anyway, that will do it. Pat Mayo Experience. Play in the Listener's League. Join FantasyNational.com slash Mayo. Check out Jeff on Twitter at GFeinberg17. If the NFL schedule is released, we will do a show on it live where you can all chime in. So be on the lookout for that. If not, we got Gary in tomorrow to put a second round of the TV bracket. Then we have Tambo on Wednesday, Ben and Kenny on Friday, research show. And then boom, me, Jeff and Tim, me, Cam and Rob, Tambo and myself. We got recap show for the PGA championship plus some NFL. It's a big two weeks on the Pat Mayo experience. So please continue to hit the like, continue to sub to the channel. We'll have a bunch of giveaways over the course of the next 10 days or so. So stay tuned for that. All right. I'm Pat Mayo. Thanks for watching. I'll see you next time. Pat Mayo experience. Experience.